You're mine now. Tonight our congregation shall witness a new miracle. I got a strange call from my manager at the time saying that this new young director wanted to see me for a project called Candyman. I thought they were joking, I hung up, I thought it was some sort of autobiography or so forth. He insisted and I went in for a meeting with Bernard Rose. We had to go through a song and dance with Propaganda Studios at the time. They were actually pushing for an Eddie Murphy type. Fortunately, Bernard uh, saw seriousness and depth in the character. We were able to meet, come together, and hopefully bring that to life. Be my victim. I am the writing on the wall, the whisper in the classroom. Without these things, I am nothing. So now, I must shed innocent blood. We both agreed that we wanted it in terms of the interpretation of Candyman to be similar to uh, the great Lon Chaney and Phantom of the Opera. We wanted the gothic elegance to his monstrosity, and I wanted it rooted in some sort of cause. So together we came up with the whole lynching, you know, him being vilified for being in love with a woman of the wrong complexion. He was black, she was white. This is circa 1900, or it could apply today, who knows. I ain't scared of nobody, but you're crazy walking here on your own. I was raised an only child. Didn't know we were poor until we were well past 13. The poverty of my upbringing, although it was kept from me, is a major part of whatever pools of sadness I can pull up. Uh, I was taught how to dig into a role, dig into a script find out what the super objectives are, what the character's point of view is, and I think I was able to bring that to it. Certainly a lot more than, uh, than a comedic take would be. Bernard had Virginia Madsen and I do things like ballroom dancing together, and we took fencing lessons. We did all kinds of the romantic arts together to bring that long lost attraction that is at the core of Candyman. Uh, loss, redemption, reclamation at whatever cost. The costume was a major part of the creation of the character. Leonard Pollock, costume designer, you know, he created, like, the pants were herringbone houndstooth, which was from that period. The, everything down to the details. Putting on the coat definitely, you know, brought me one step closer to finding the skin of the role, the skin of Granville, the skin of Candyman. I think Candyman was definitely came along at the right time, at the right place. This was a horror film that had intelligence, um, had a social commentary, was able to use the wonderful city of Chicago as its landscape. You know, Chicago is such a great architectural, majestic city, filled with passions, filled with sports, filled with food, and also filled with people trying to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. There was uh, five active gangs operating in Cabrini Green. Hands up, people! Five more, come out the back door! Police! It's okay, they think we're cops. They're not gonna follow us. I found out later, not only did they have to pay off some gang members, and if you look at the first half hour, those are actual gang members in the film that are careening around the entrances. Is, but they also had police snipers. It was real deal. Number four, step forward and set a line. We hear you're looking for Candyman, bitch. Step back. Bernard Rose is one of the most intelligent directors I've ever worked with. I mean, I'm not gonna make any excuses for his lack or depth of racial uh, comparisons, but I know, in his, I know the man's heart, and I know he fought. Not only did he have to fight with the NAACP, who was afraid of a horror film that was gonna depict an African-American man in a bad light, but it is a horror film, and I think we won that battle over the test of time. I heard her screaming. I heard her right through the walls. I dialed 911. Nobody came. Nobody came. Everybody's scared. He, he could come right through these walls, you know? I'm scared. Scared for my child. They ain't never gonna catch him. Who? Candyman. 
Candyman. I think films like Get Out and Candyman, there are different scares for different sets of people. You know, it's all relative based on your personal experiences. I think films that bring up racial disparities are a good thing for discussions. I know that there have been several or many college dissertations written on Candyman and his impact to society. If you just took the horror out of it and just looked at it as an isolationist, you don't know who Candyman is, you don't know why he's there, he seems utterly focused on one specific goal, which is to reclaim his lost love, no matter what. It was always you, Helen. It was always you. So Virginia was the last person who had to sign off for me to play the character. She was an associate producer. So we had a lovely lunch on La Cienega, and in the middle of one spoonful of, uh, it was some sort of cold yellow squash soup. She said, yes, you know, it's gonna be a lovely time, and, uh, and I thank God for her uh, signing off on this. In the end, when Virginia finally comes into the lair, this is something that they didn't include in the film. She comes into the lair. We had a deal. Surrender to me now, and he shall be unharmed. There's a great, we had a, a, a plexiglass turntable and we swirl around for a minute. That scene, they took two minutes out of that scene. And uh, we got word that the studio was a little afraid of the interracial context because it's a very romantic moment. And then after that, I grab her in the arms and I lay her down on the slab. She is mine at that point. But they declared their love for each other in that swirling dance. And the studio was a little nervous about that. They were okay with a tall black man covered with bees, but when, you know, when it came to a kiss or something like that, it was a little bit too risque. The bees, the bees, the bees. The bees had their own trailer. Uh, it was a little bigger than mine, but since I didn't work as much as they did, it was okay. We had this wonderful uh, bee wrangler. I never knew such thing existed until I started working this thing. But anyway, his name was Dr. Norman Gary. And he says, Tony, you gotta face your fears. We gotta go into this trailer. We gotta get acquainted. I said, is it necessary, Norman? He says, absolutely, because it's gonna be you, them, and me, and you, and them. The wackiest thing that ever happened was Norman said, come on, Tony. He pushed me in the trailer, locked the door. He says, I'm here, they're not gonna do anything. And they're swarming around, they're angry, the wings are agitated. And he started saying, no, all you gotta do is personalize them. And I said, what do you mean, Norman? He says, well, there's little Daryl, and there's Jeffrey, Hey, come here, Ethan, how are you today? I thought he was nuts, but I realized by personalizing him, you take away some of the fear. So therefore, in the course of three films, I only got 26 stings, mostly on the chest, because they had practicals, folks, so they actually had a little ray of vac that they used to vacuum the bees off of me. Candyman, she turned out the lights. <laughs> I love Candyman. I'm pretty sure that at this point Candyman would be in the first three lines of my obituary and I have no problem with that. Helen. Bernard told me later on that any film that a child cherishes and remembers they're gonna hold it in their hearts forever and I think that explains some of the longevity and the love of the character. I mean whenever I go to conventions it's never there's never a dull moment or a short line of people waiting for that particular picture, even though I have 200 credits. <laughs>